We say hello, good morning to the Respect MP, George Galloway, and uh, the former U.S. intelligence officer, Bob Ayers. Gentlemen, um, first of all, George Galloway, why the change in tone from tone? Well, they're constantly looking for something that will get them out of this terrible mess that they've gotten us all into, a bloody mess uh, for our soldiers, four of whom died on Remembrance Sunday, and uh, this is clutching at yet another straw. Insofar as it might have been helpful at one time, it's a too little, too late stratagem hedged around with all sorts of demands on Syria and Iran that they admit that they've been beating their wives and agree to stop it and so on. Uh, I'm afraid it will not end the war because the war does not depend on Iran or Syria. The Iraqis themselves are up in arms against the occupation in sufficient numbers as to cause terrible attrition to our and the American forces and that will not stop until we leave. Yeah. But I should say to you, George Galloway, this is a tactic the Prime Minister has tried before. He's tried it in Northern Ireland, um, engaging with the enemy, um, as it were, and it worked from there. Well, it's not Syria and Iran who are the enemy, of course. It's the Iraqis who are fighting the occupying forces and uh, doing a terribly efficient job of it, in the sense that 3,000 poor American soldiers, uh, now well over 100 poor British soldiers have had to give their lives blood because of the Bush and Blair occupation of Iraq. And that's not going to stop because you okay. uh, throw down a lot of conditions under which you will speak to the neighboring countries. Of course they should speak to the neighboring countries. They should have done so long ago. That's what the anti-war movement was arguing from but, the very beginning. But in your but view... Better late than never, but it's probably too little and too late. Okay, too little, too late, says George Galloway, Bob Bears. What are your reservations about entering into talks with these countries? I think the first thing we have to recognize is that both Syria and Iran are involved in the conflict. They're both providing support to the warring factions, with Syria supporting Sunnis and the former Ba'athist regime, and Iran supporting the Shia combatants within the, the country. If we do engage in any sort of discussion with these two nation states, then the, the typical coin on the table that is used for bargaining is either territorial acquisition, it's either political power enhancement, or it's economic gain. Now, I'd hate to think that if we do engage in any sort of bargaining with these people, that we would be willing to cede some territory that isn't ours to cede to them. I'd also hate to think that we want to enhance the political power of two of the major destabilizing regimes in the region. And lastly, if we're trying to incentivize them to allow us to withdraw gracefully, then we're going to do that with economic means. And the question becomes, how much are we willing to pay to be allowed to declare some form of success and extricate ourselves from the situation we find ourselves in now? All this assumes, George Galloway, that Iran and Syria want us to talk to them, do they? Well, it's a bit rich, I must say, because Iran, of course, has been already made enormously powerful in Iraq by us. It's one of the bizarre achievements of the neocon foreign policy that the country they fear most, Iran, against which they encouraged Saddam Hussein to fight a long war in the 1980s, so fearful of the Iranian revolution were they, is now vastly powerful, especially across the south of Iraq, uh, where its place men are in place everywhere, and its uh, militias that it supports are already ruling the roost there. So you don't have to cede any territory to Iran in order to talk to them. You've already ceded the territory to them. But I stress this point. We mustn't develop this into another of those magic turning points. Remember them? Remember the capture of Saddam, the killing of his sons, the signing of constitutions, the killing of Abu Musab al zarqawi remember him? That was going to be the beginning of the end of all this. We mustn't make this Iran-Syria talks uh, another chimera, which uh, we persuade ourselves is going to bring things to an end, only to be bitterly disappointed, because the people who pay the price for the disappointment are the young soldiers that we've sent there uh, to give their life's blood. And meanwhile, Bob Bears, I'm looking at a headline in the front of the Daily Telegraph this morning. Iran plotting to groom bin Laden's successor. Uh, will dialogue bring to an end things like this? Oh, it's, it's very, very doubtful. I, I note that Mr. Galloway is very eloquent at describing uh, past conditions and past mistakes. 
But the one thing I find lacking in everything that he says is any description of an articulate way ahead. He just criticizes but offers no alternative. Okay, offer me an alternative, George Galloway. This is, this is the man whose government has killed hundreds of thousands of people, turned the world upside down, sent flames and hatred everywhere, and he wants me to come up with the answer. Have some humility for God's sake. Have some humility for God's sake. You should be embarrassed coming on the television. Mr. Galloway, I'm a Brit, so if you're criticizing your own government, then that's fine, but that still doesn't compensate for no offer of a constructive way ahead. But, but, well, but I have all many constructive ways ahead, but the neocon foreign policy, which you as an American intelligence officer, which is how you were introduced, if you're a Brit, then our influence is greater in Washington than I thought. Yeah. And you don't sound much like a Brit, but if you are, I apologize. Well, Bob, the as reality well, as well, does, does it not strike you as a bit uh, paradoxical that the Prime Minister today will speak to the Baker inquiry in Washington and not publicly to the House of Commons on all of this? Paul Bears. Well, it strikes me a little bit paradoxical. We're still hoping for a debate in the, uh, in the House, but we haven't had one that I would consider to be a legitimate debate on what our war aims and objectives are now. Yeah. Well, can we really afford not to do business with Iran and Iraq? Well, the question becomes doing business with anyone relies on them behaving according to what they say they're going to do. If we believe that Iran and Iraq will behave as honorable men right. and act on their stated intentions, then okay. that poses a difficulty for their stated intentions vis-a-vis -vis the state of Israel. Right. Well, let me ask George Galloway, do you think um, uh, Iran and Syria will honor their international obligations? Will they behave? Will they be good boys, do you think? Well, Eamon, they don't have any obligation to get Britain and America out of the mess that they got themselves into in Iraq. After all, they warned Britain and America not to do this. Uh, as did the anti-war movement, though I, I note that I'm now being asked to come up with a solution for the mess that other people have made. Uh, so we, we oughtn't to place these conditions. We'll, we'll be lucky if Iran and Syria even agree to talk to us. After all, we've caused total devastation in the area against their advice in the first place. Okay. Well, George Galloway, thank you for talking to us this morning. And Ball Bears, thank you both very much indeed. You'll get our emails uh, working very hard today and the phone's ringing off the hook. Thank you both very much indeed.